Hello friends, uh, welcome back. Have you heard about barbiturates? Obviously, as nurses, we will be coming across many drugs in our daily clinical practice. But as far as the NIMHANS nursing officer exam is concerned, you will be getting in-depth questions or in, de in uh, detailed questions can be expected from areas like uh, drug pharmacology, especially psychiatric drugs and neurological drugs. So in the beginning, I asked you about the barbiturates, you know where it is acting, what are the types of the barbiturates, those things. So like that questions you can expect in the enhanced nursing officer examination and uh, I am welcoming you all back to another important series what we have already started for cracking the upcoming Nimhans nursing uh, recruitment examination which is scheduled on December 8th, 8th 17th. So uh, this series also contains 15 very very important question and one among the question is regarding the barbiturates and uh, you will be getting an idea what type of questions you will can expect in the Nimhans nursing officer examination through these videos. So uh, welcoming you all back once again and I request everyone who are not yet subscribed to our channel kindly subscribe and support us and enable the bell, by, uh, bell icon so that uh, you will be notified when we are uploading the new set of videos. So straight away we will move on to the uh, questions. So watch the video till the end without skipping because explanations as I am telling in all the videos explanations are also very very important. So straight away to the questions. Here comes the first question in the new series. So the question for you, which among the following is a common adverse effect of flumazenil? So flumazenil is the drug that I have asked in this question. So which is the common adverse effect of flumazenil? That is a question. And the options are option number A, seizures, option number B, shivering, option number C, anxiety and option number D, chest pain. So in uh, Niemann's examinations, you can expect uh, especially pharmacology, uh, psychopharmacology questions and uh, in the previous examinations also many questions regarding the psychopharmacology have asked. So this is such a question. So flumazenil, you know that it is the antidote of benzodiazepines. So which is, which is the common adverse effects of flumazenil? That is a question and uh, the answer for this question is option number A that is seizures. Okay. So we'll have a small explanation regarding this question. So flumazenil, it is a selective GABA receptor antagonist which is administered via injection, otic insertion or intranasally. Okay. So therapeutically, it acts as both an antagonist and antidote to benzodiazepines, particularly in the case of overdose through competitive inhibition. Okay. So the main thing what you have to understand here is it is a selective GABA receptor antagonist. Okay. So the adverse reactions, the river, it reverses the effects of benzodiazepine by competitive inhibition at the benzodiazepine recognition site on the GABA or the benzodiazepine receptor complex. Okay. So this is, this is the action how it acts as an antidote for the benzodiazepines. So coming to the answer for our question, seizures are the most common adverse effect of using the flumazenil to reverse the benzodiazepine overdose. So the effect is magnified if the client has a combined tricyclic antidepressant and benzodiazepine overdose. Okay. So this effect will be more if the patient was taking tricyclic antidepressant also along with the benzodiazepine. So less common adverse effects include shivering, anxiety, chest pain, etc. So the most common is seizures and the less least common are shivering, anxiety and chest pain. Okay. Now uh, we can see the second question in this series. So the question is which of the following medications is the nurse likely to administer to reduce the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. So I'll be giving some options, some medicines in that you have to find out which is the drug used for alcohol withdrawal symptoms to reduce the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. So the options are option number A, naloxone. Option number B, haloperidol. Option number C, magnesium sulfate. And option number D, chlordiazepoxide. So you should uh, uh, first very carefully you should read this question because the question is regarding to reduce the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. Okay. So the answer is option number D that is chlordiazepoxide otherwise known as a librium. So we will have an explanation. So chlordiazepoxide among others it is a sedative and hypnotic medication 
of benzodiazepine class and it is used to treat anxiety, insomnia and the symptoms of withdrawal from alcohol and other drugs, especially alcohol withdrawal. Okay. So, it belongs to the class benzodiazepines. Okay. So, another two information you are getting out of this paragraph. Then, chlordioxypoxide or the Librium and other tranquilizers help reduce the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal and we will see the other options regarding haloperidol so haloperidol may be given to treat the clients with the psychosis severe agitation or delirium okay so in alcohol addiction also at the time of withdrawal the patients will be agitated that time this haloperidol will help to reduce the severe agitation or the delirium or psychosis okay not to treat with the alcohol dependence then what about naloxone naloxone is administered for the narcotic overdose not for the alcohol withdrawal and another option was magnesium sulfate so you know that magnesium sulfate and other anticonvulsant medications are only administered to treat the seizures if they occur during the withdrawal magnesium sulfate using uh, obstetrics also we have uh, we know that but in alcohol withdrawal if the patient is presented with the withdrawal seizures that time comes the uh, use of magnesium sulfate and other anticonvulsant medications okay so these points you have to keep in mind the haloperidol for agitation naloxone for narcotic overdose magnesium sulfate in alcohol withdrawal is only for treating the uh, seizures okay so chlordiazepoxide is the answer for the question what i have asked okay so with that question we will be moving on to the third question this is again from psychiatry need of positive pressure ventilation or oxygen by mask is necessary during ect because so what is the need of oxygen during the procedure of ect so that is a question and the options are Option number A, anesthesia is administered during the procedure because of that oxygen need to be given. Then option number B, decrease oxygen to the brain increases the confusion and disorientation. Then option number C, granule seizure activity depresses the respiration. So we need to give the oxygen. Then option number D, muscle relaxants given during the seizure activity depresses the respiration. So, among these reasons, which is the reason for administering oxygen by mask during the procedure, during the ECT procedure? So, that is a question. So, what is the answer? The answer for this question is option number D. Obviously, that is the muscle relaxants. What we are giving during the procedure uh, can depress the respiration. Okay. So, very small explanation for this question. We know that muscle relaxants may influence the respiration by depressing the respiratory center, inhibiting the neuromuscular transmission of the respiratory muscles or altering the airway resistance and or its compliances. Okay. So, these are the side effects what we can see with the use of muscle relaxants. During the procedure, a short acting skeletal muscle relaxant such as the succinyl choline is administered during the procedure to prevent injuries during the seizures. Okay, so in the ECT procedure, and I am not going in depth. So in the procedure, we are inducing a seizure. So the optimal dose of the muscle relaxant for the ECT, it reduces the muscle contractions without inducing complete paralysis. So slight residual motor convulsive activity is helpful in ascertaining that a seizure has occurred while total paralysis prolongs the procedure unnecessarily so that is the reason we are using this skeletal muscle relaxants okay so this skeletal muscle relaxants can depress the respiratory center and thereby causing uh, decrease the saturation and other problems so that's why we are giving oxygen so next uh, the question number four is on the screen so after having an iv line in place for 72 hours a patient complains of tenderness burning and swelling assessment of the iv site reveals that it is warm and erythematous so this usually indicates what so here a clinical scenario has been given for you so the patient is having iv line for the past 22 72 hours and there is a tenderness burning sensation and swelling along with that it is warm and erythematous so what these findings indicate so that is a question it's a tricky question and the options are option number a infection Option number B, infiltration. Option number C, phlebitis. And option number D, thrombosis. So, in this, what is the answer? So, you know, it's slightly confusing. The options are slightly confusing. But uh, the answer for this question is option number C, that is phlebitis. Okay. 
phlebitis is the answer so uh, we know that phlebitis or venitis it is the inflammation of a vein usually in the legs okay so it most commonly occurs in the superficial veins okay superficial veins and phlebitis often occurs in conjunction with thrombosis and is then called thrombophlebitis or superficial thrombophlebitis okay so don't be confused with the mm, uh, thrombitis and all okay so tenderness warmth swelling and in some instances a burning sensation are the signs and symptoms of phlebitis okay so this is regarding the phlebitis and the other options we will see thrombosis what is thrombosis thrombosis is extremely different it is a formation of a blood clot that is partial or complete blockage can happen within the blood vessels whether the venous or arterial limiting the natural flow of the blood and results in clinical sequelae okay so that is a thrombosis so this is defined different from thrombitis or venitis okay don't be confused then another option was the infiltration so what is the iv infiltration iv infiltration and extravasations occur when fluid leaks out of the vein into the surrounding soft tissues okay so as the name indicates it is the leakage of the fluid out of the vein so the common signs include inflammation tightness of the skin and pain around the iv side so iv infiltration is a common complication of iv therapy and infiltration would result in swelling and pallor but not edema edema will not be there near the insertion site okay so but in our question i have given edema as a sign okay so that's why infiltration is not the answer for that question okay so the final option was regarding the infection so infection in the case in the case scenario what i have given infection is not there because there is no drainage or fever is present okay so don't be confused with the infection infiltration uh, then uh, venitis or the phlebitis okay so don't be confused so i think that was a very informative and important question for you now we will move on to the fifth question in our series which intervention is an example of primary prevention so i'll be giving you some options so in that you have to find out which is the primary prevention so the options are option number a administering digoxin to a patient with heart failure option number b administering mmr vaccination to an infant option number c obtaining a pap smear to screen for cervical cancer and option number d using occupational therapy to help a patient cope up with arthritis so four different conditions have been given and in this you have to find out what is a, an example for primary prevention easy question so if you know the concept you can answer this question very easily and i know that you have chosen the answer number b that is administering mmr vaccination to an infant so uh, have, we will have a small uh, explanation regarding the three prevention levels no, sorry the four prevention levels so first of all i will be telling about the primary prevention so intervening before the health effects occurs okay primary prevention means intervening before the health effects occur through measures such as vaccination altering the risky behaviors then banning substances known to be associated etc okay so in the option what we have given that uh, uh, <coughs> immunization and all will come under this okay so secondary prevention means screening screening secondary means it is a screening to identify the diseases in the earliest stages before the onset of signs and symptoms so they can adopt certain measures such as mammography or some diagnostic measures or the regular blood pressure testing pathmias testing etc so in secondary prevention the disease is detected and treated early often before the symptoms are present so thus minimizing the serious consequences or the complications so the examples already we have in the options itself it is there but that administering the digoxin to a patient with the heart failure is an example for the secondary prevention what i have given in the options okay so that is a secondary prevention then comes a tertiary prevention and option number d is an example for tertiary prevention and it is the implemented symptomatic patients and it aims to reduce the severity of the disease as well as any associated sequelae so while secondary prevention seeks to prevent the onset of illness tertiary prevention aims to reduce the effects of the disease 
once established in an individual. So in the secondary prevention that complications are getting minimized but in the tertiary prevention that it uh, once the um, everything is set, uh, established, the disease is established and uh, we are aiming to reduce the effects of the disease. Okay, so rehabilitation and all will come in that. Okay, so another one important point. So how we will be differentiating between the primary prevention and primordial prevention. So the primary prevention is all about treating the risk factors. Okay, while the primordial prevention refers to avoiding the development of risk factors in the first place. So I can explain to you with a small example. So we know that uh, the risk factors for the heart disease are like uh, lifestyle changes like uh, smoking, alcoholism, poor eating habits, those things. Okay, so a patient was, in, uh, a, a, a person was in these circulars, right? Like, uh, they were uh, he was uh, using uh, alcohol he was using uh, st uh, this one uh, smoking he was smoking before and for preventing the development of cardiac diseases he stopped in some period and adopted a healthy lifestyle so that is a primary prevention but keeping in mind that these conditions can uh, result in the development of cardiovascular diseases and a person is not even touched with uh, an alcohol or uh, ha didn't have a habit of smoking so that is known as the primordial prevention okay so that is the difference between these two okay so i think um, that is clear for you so we will be moving on to the next question in our series that is the sixth question which of the following is the most common cause of dementia among elderly person so this is a very simple question so the options are option number a parkinson's disease option number b multiple sclerosis option number c amyotropic lateral sclerosis and option number d alzheimer's disease so which is the common cause of dementia among elderly persons so the answer is option number d that is alzheimer's disease so we know that the Alzheimer's disease sometimes known as the senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type or the primary degenerative dementia and it is an insidious, progressive, irreversible and degenerative disease of the brain whose etiology is still unknown. Okay, so giving light to some other uh, names for the Alzheimer's disease that is a senile dementia uh, or primary degenerative dementia. Okay. So other options that Parkinson's disease, it is a neurological disorder which is caused by any lesions in the extra pyramidal system and manifested by the tremors, muscle rigidity, hypokinesia, dysphagia, dysphonia, etc, etc. So this is a very vast topic, just a outline I am giving and uh, multiple sclerosis, it is a progressive degenerative disease involving the demyelination of the nerve fibers usually begins in the young adulthood and it is marked by periods of remission and exacerbation and what is amyotropic lateral sclerosis so it is a disease which is marked by progressive degeneration of the neurons eventually resulting in the atrophy of all the muscles including those necessary for the respiration okay so this is also a medical emergency so these are the other options what I have given. So um, that was such a uh, simple question. Now we will be seeing the seventh question in our series. So the question is barbiturates affect the DASH receptors in the CNS. Barbiturates affect DASH receptors in the CNS. So the options are GABA B receptors. Option number B GABA A receptors. Option number C glutamate receptor. And the final one is muscarinic receptors. So where the barbiturates are affecting. So the answer for this question is GABA A receptors. Okay, not GABA B, GABA A receptors. So we know that barbiturates, these are a class of depressant drugs that are chemically derived from the barbituric acid and they are effective when used medically as anxiolytics hypnotic and anticonvulsants. Okay, it has anxiolytic property, hypnotic property and anticonvulsant property. So barbiturates, uh, we can classify the barbiturates that is the action I am explaining to you. It is a sh ultra short acting barbiturates which acts within 30 minutes and example is the thiopendone. Then short acting which acts within 2 hours and example is the hexobarbitone or the cyclobarbitone. Then intermediate acting barbiturates, it will act within 3 to 6 hours and examples are amobarbitone and uh, uh, butabarbitone and the long acting that will take 6 hours to act and it 
example is the phenobarbitone okay so these are some additional information that i am giving you and it will help you out of the exam which is coming shortly okay so this barbiturates will bind to the gaba a receptors at multiple homologous transmembrane pockets which are located at the subunit interfaces so gaba is the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter in the mammalian central nervous system okay so gaba is a uh, gaba a is the receptor site for the barbiturates so that is the answer for the question what i have asked okay so we will see the uh, very next question in this series, uh, the question in the screen. So what is the primary purpose of a platelet count? Okay, primary purpose of a platelet count is to evaluate dash. So that is the question. So the key point in this question is the primary purpose. Okay, primary purpose. So the options for you are option number A, potential for clot formation. Option number B, potential for bleeding. C. Presence of an antigen antibody response and option number D. Presence of cardiac enzymes. So what is the primary purpose of a platelet count? So what is the answer? I think that two, two uh, options may confuse you. So the answer is obviously option number A that is a potential for cloud formation. Okay, This is the primary purpose. but bleeding also is there but the primary purpose is potential for the clot formation so we will have a small explanation regarding this question so platelets these are the disc shaped cells that are essential for the blood coagulation so blood coagulation so a platelet count determines the number of thrombocytes in the blood available for promoting hemostasis and assisting with blood coagulation after the injury so this is the purpose so Platelet count determines the number of thrombocytes which are available in the blood for promoting the hemostasis and assisting with the blood coagulation after the injury. So it is also used to evaluate the potential for bleeding. However, this is not its primary purpose. Okay. So that's why I, I told that the key point in the question what we have asked is the primary purpose of the platelet. So the normal count ranges from 1.5 lakhs to 3.5 lakhs per cubic millimeter and a count of 1 lakh per cubic millimeter or less indicate a potential for bleeding and a count of less than 20,000 per cubic millimeter is associated with spontaneous bleeding. Okay, so these are the some additional points that you can remember regarding the platelet. Okay, so uh, that's all regarding that question. So now we can move on to the next question in our series. So the question is a recumbent immobilized patient is prone to which among the following lung complication. So here the question is asking regarding um, complications of immobility and here specifically they asked about the lung complication for a recumbent immobilized patient. Okay. So the options are option number A, a respiratory acidosis, atelectasis and hypostatic pneumonia. Option number B apneustic breathing atypical pneumonia and respiratory alkalosis option number c chain strokes respiration and spontaneous pneumothorax and option number d kussmolz respirations and hypoventilation kussmolz respirations and hypoventilation so what is the answer <clears throat> so the question uh, looks like easy but the options are slightly difficult so but easily you can find out the answer. So what is the answer? So the answer is option number A that is respiratory acidosis, atelectasis and hypostatic pneumonia. Okay, so <clears throat> we know that because of the respiratory, restricted respiratory movement, a recumbent immobilized patient is at particular risk for respiratory acidosis from poor gas exchange okay so the reason for respiratory acidosis is the pure gas exchange then atelectasis that is a collapse of the alveoli can happen from reduced surfactant and accumulated mucus in the bronchioles and hypostatic pneumonia can occur 
from the bacterial growth which are which can be caused by the stasis of mucus secretions so respiratory acidosis because of pure gas exchange atrectasis because of reduced surfactant secretion and accumulated mucus and hypostatic pneumonia because of the bacterial growth in the mucus secretions okay so this is the answer for the question what i have asked okay so don't be confused between respiratory acidosis and alkalosis so we will see the other options also so what is the apneistic breathing apneistic breathing it is characterized by prolonged gasping inhalations followed by extremely short and inadequate exhalation so in apneistic breathing the inspiration will be prolonged and it is of the gasping type but the expiration will be very short extremely short and inadequate so this pattern uh, results from the upper pons damage often due to the stroke or trauma signifying severe brain injury and it have a very poor prognosis okay so these are some additional points that you can remember regarding the apneistic breathing it, it is due to the presence of some injury or some damage to the upper pons of the brain okay so apneistic breathing is clear now so another option was the chain strokes respiration so this is another specific form of periodic breathing that means a waxing and waning amplitude of flow or the tidal volume is happening characterized by a crescendo descendo decrescendo pattern of respiration between central apneas or central hypopneas okay so crescendo pattern and the decrescendo pattern of respiration will be there and in between that is inspiration and expiration that is crescendo and decrescendo pattern and in between there will be periods of apnea or hypopnea will be there and that is a specific type of respiration which is called as a chain strokes respiration okay now the another option was the kusmol's breathing so you know that kusmol's breathing it is an abnormal breathing pattern which is characterized by a rapid deep breathing at a consistent space okay so the pace will be consistent but the rate will be rapid and there will be deep breathing and it is a sign of medical emergency usually associated with dka or diabetic ketoacidosis and the physiology pathophysiology and all i am not going in depth but these are the additional points i am giving you a hint to prepare well for the upcoming examination okay so that's all regarding that question now we will be seeing our 10th question in this series thrombophlebitis typically develops in patients with which of the following conditions so question is thrombophlebitis typically develops in patients with which of the following conditions so the options are option number a increased partial thromboplast in time option number b acute pulses paradoxes option number c an impaired or traumatized blood vessel wall and option number d chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or copd so in which among these conditions the patient is uh, prone to develop thrombophlebitis so i am inviting your attention towards a theory that i will be explaining now so first we will see the answer for this question so the answer for this question is an impaired or traumatized blood vessel wall okay so i have told you about a theory so in theory a virtuous triad a virtuous triad postulates the presence of three factors that predisposes a person to develop vascular thrombosis and these factors include the first one is the blood regarding the blood hypercoagulability of the blood then the sex, second factor is the alteration in the blood flow in the vessels and finally the vessel wall injury or the endothelial damage so whoever having any of these factors that is a virtuous triad like hypercoagulability of the blood alteration in the flow of the blood in the blood vessels and the vessel wall injury or the endothelial damage so these patients are prone to get uh, thrombophlebitis and this theory is known as the virtuous triad okay virtuous triad for the development of thrombophlebitis okay so <clears throat> in the other options we will see now increased partial thromboplast in time indicates a prolonged bleeding time during the fibrin clot formation and it commonly the result of anticoagulant or the heparin therapy like that so that is not related to the thrombophlebitis then other options like uh, arterial blood disorders such as pulses paradoxes then lung diseases such as copd and all do not this not necessarily impede the venous return of the injured vessel wall okay so all the other conditions what i have given in the options are not coming in the virtuous triad factors so that's why that they are not a part of the development of 
thrombophlebitis so i think you got uh, the point from this question okay so uh, we can move on to the 11th 11th question in our series so which patient below is at most risk for developing a condition called autonomic dysreflexia so this question is regarding autonomic dysreflexia and the question is which patient is at most risk for developing condition so the option number one a tbi patient traumatic brain injury patient then option number b a patient with a spinal cord injury at the level of c7 next option a spinal cord injury at the level of l6 then option number d a patient recovering from a hemorrhagic stroke so which patient is at risk for developing autonomic dysreflexia and the very very important topic uh, in exam point of view especially for the Niemann's examination so what is the answer so the answer is option number b that is a patient with a spinal cord injury at c7 okay so uh, we will see what is autonomic dysreflexia already we have explained many questions regarding this topic in the previous videos so autonomic dysreflexia or id it is a potential fatal medical emergency classically characterized by uncontrolled hypertension and cardiac arrhythmias so uncontrolled hypertension and the development of cardiac arrhythmias make it a medical emergency so who is prone for autonomic dysreflexia ad occurs most often in individuals with spinal cord injuries with lesions at or above the t6 spinal cord level so thoracic 6 t6 or above although it has been reported in patients with lesions as low as t10 okay so in exam point of view you should remember these two points one is t6 level so if in the question you are getting an option above the level of t6 then that could be the answer for the question or if it is between t10 and t6 also it is right because it can happen in lesions that is as low as t10 also okay so the other condition that can cause the autonomic dysreflexia is the guillain barry syndrome okay this is another syndrome that may also cause the autonomic dysreflexia otherwise the spinal cord injury at the level of t6 or or above or as low as t10 okay so that's all regarding that question regarding the autonomic dysreflexia very very important you can read further regarding this autonomic dysreflexia and management also okay very very important so moving on to the 12th question in our series so which finding below during your assessment in a patient with gbs requires immediate nursing action okay so the question is regarding the gbs and you are assessing a patient with gbs so what requires an immediate action so the options are option number a the patient reports a headache option number b the patient has a weak cough option number c the patient has absent reflexes in the lower extremities and option number d the patient reports paresthesia in the upper extremities so just think about this gbs where it is affecting and what are the complications then definitely you will be guided to the option number b that is the answer for the question the patient has a weak cough okay so gbs you know that the patient's signs and symptoms in this scenario are typical with the guillain barry syndrome but the syndrome tends to starts in the lower extremities that is in the ascending pattern with paresthesia that will progress to paralysis and migrate upwards so the question was regarding the immediate action that the nurse has to take immediate emergency action so the respiratory system can be affected leading to respiratory failure so therefore the nurse should assess for any signs and symptoms that the respiratory system may be compromised such as weak cough shortness of breath dyspnea etc etc okay so the respiratory system muscles respiratory muscles can be affected by gbs so the compensations compromisation of the respiratory signs like weak cough shortness of breath dyspnea need to be assessed and need to be informed or reported immediately so the nurse should immediately report this because the patient may need mechanical ventilation so guillain barry syndrome and other diseases are very 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 important in niemann's exam point of view and along with that absent reflexes is common 
uh, is in GBS and paresthesia can also extend to the upper extremities as the syndrome progresses. Okay, these are, can also happen but that is not an emergency and headache is not common at all. Okay, so the first option headache is not common. The other options are there in GBS but the question was regarding the immediate action what we will take for the symptom and that is the answer regarding the respiratory compromisation. Okay. So that's all regarding that question. Now we will be seeing the 13th question in our series. So the two blood vessels most commonly used for TPN infusion are TPN means total parental nutrition. So we know that what is total parental nutrition for that which blood vessels are most commonly used. Okay. So the options are option number A subclavian and jugular veins. Option number B brachial and subclavian veins. Option number C, femoral and subclavian veins. And the final option number D, brachial and femoral veins. So, which are the two main blood vessels what we are using for total parental nutrition? So, the answer is option number A, that is a subclavian and jugular veins. Subclavian and jugular veins. Okay, so you know that the total parental nutrition requires the use of a large vessel such as the subclavian or the jugular vein to ensure rapid dilution of the solution and thereby prevent complications such as hyperglycemia okay so we need a large vessel such as subclavian or jugular and the purpose is to ensure a rapid dilution of the solution and thus by preventing the complications like hyperglycemia okay so the brachial and femoral veins usually are contraindicated because they pose an increased risk of thrombophlebitis okay brachial and femoral should be avoided because there are high risk of developing thrombophlebitis okay so total parental nutrition and the veins used i think that is clear for you now we will be seeing the second last question in our series so an individual's unique hypersensitivity to a drug is called as dash from pharmacology another interesting question individuals unique hypersensitivity to a drug is termed as what so the options are option number a tolerance option number b idiosyncrasy option number c synergism and option number d allergy so what is the answer <coughs> unique hypersensitivity answer is option number b that is a idiosyncrasy okay idiosyncrasy so we will see that terms so idiosyncrasy means an unusual response or a highly exaggerated usual response to usual doses to some drugs in few individuals okay so this is the exact definition unusual response or a highly exaggerated response to usual doses of some drugs in few individuals so it is an individual's unique hypersensitivity to a drug or a food or other substances and it appears to be genetically determined okay so that is in short in short explanation regarding idiosyncrasy so we will be seeing the another options also so what is a tolerance tolerance always associated with addiction um, medicine so tolerance to a drug means that the patient experiences a decreasing physiological response to a repeated administration of the drug in the same dosage okay the the physiological response to the repeated administration of the same dose of the drug can cause a reduced response physiological response that is known as the tolerance okay then what is a drug allergy simple thing is an adverse reaction resulting from an immunological response following a previous sensitizing exposure to the drug so the reaction can range from a simple rash or hives to anaphylactic shock and finally what is synergism synergism it is a drug interaction in which some of the drugs combined effects some some means the addition of the drugs combined effects is greater than that of their separate effects okay so two medicines if they are combined together their effect will be greater and sometimes it may be harmful sometimes it may be helpful okay so for the example i can tell like aspirin and caffeine so these are the examples of synergism in that when combined they provide greater efficacy and brain relief in patients with pain so aspirin alone can 
have some effect and caffeine have some effect but if they are combined together the effect will be exaggerated or sometimes it will be helpful and sometimes it will be harmful so this is known as the synergism so don't be confused between idiosyncrasy and synergism okay so another very very important additional information for you so that's all regarding that second last question and we are moving to the final question in our series so this question from the gastrointestinal system where will the nurse make it priority to position the tubing and drainage bag of the T tube so the question is regarding the T tube and you should know what is a T tube T tube and for what procedure T tube is used and then only you can answer this question so the options we will see first the option number a slightly elevated above the T tube insertion site option number B at the hard level option number c midline with the t tube insertion site then option number d at or below the waist so where you will be securing the t tube after a surgery okay there you will be securing so the answer is option number d at or below the waist level so what is a t tube so a T tube it is a T shaped tube placed in the common bile duct after the procedures involving the duct okay or the bile duct the T tubes are used after cholecystectomy okay this is an indication so regarding the T tube and uh, its management and its purpose those things you can refer later so while we are placing the T tube drainage the T tube drainage bag and the tubings will work with the assistance of gravity to drain the bile so therefore the tubings and the drainage bag should be placed below the t tube insertion site okay t tube insertion site will be there and should be placed below that because the gravity is assisting in drainage of the uh, 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 drainage of the bile so which is at or below the base level to help the draining of the bile okay so that's all regarding the t tube and uh, the placement of the t tube and with that question we are coming to the end of another important session for the uh, nimans nursing officer preparation hope you understand this and if any doubts in any questions you are free to ask in the comment section and we will try our level best to answer your queries and if you need any clarification any clarification regarding these exams kindly uh, post your comments in the comment section and uh, we will be answering for your questions and with that uh, we are coming to the end of this session and um, i request everyone uh, to keep in touch with us and we'll be coming with another set of videos very shortly till that time bye